This is BBC Radio 4. Now, today in Blood Matters, Blanche Giroud hears how one little girl was orphaned when her parents died from AIDS caused by contaminated blood. I am the little girl who is alone. I am the little girl who is scared. I am the little girl who is broken hearted all because it didn't heal you. I am the Lauren lost both parents to AIDS as a result of infected factor eight concentrate. She was just nine. Who longed for your hugs and kisses during her hardest times. I am that little girl who still misses you every day because it poisoned you. In the 1970s and 1980s, thousands of people suffering from haemophilia were given the revolutionary blood product known as Factor VIII to replace their missing clotting agent. It was a major breakthrough in the treatment of bleeding disorders. But some batches of the concentrate they received were contaminated with hepatitis and HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. Over 1,100 of those infected have since died, and thousands more lives have been devastated. I'm Blanche Girouard and I've been following this scandal for years, listening to the stories of those infected and affected as they wait for justice. For BBC Radio 4, this is Blood Matters. Episode 5, Left Behind. So what do we have here? Oh wow, that's right, that that's picture the from the newspaper. newspaper. Sweet. Mm-hmm. And this is because it was the twenty. You were born on the Christmas day. Christmas yeah. Day. So we were automatically in the paper. <laughs> that's a lovely photo. Uh, Lauren Palmer comes across as an outgoing, bubbly young woman, full of energy. For many years, she didn't talk about her family and her traumatic story. And and do you have other photos of your dad? No, unfortunately, we don't have any. So can you just introduce yourself? I'm Lauren Palmer. I am 39 years old and I live in Bristol uh, with my lovely housemate. And I am currently studying a forensic science degree. Lauren's early memories are of growing up with her mum, dad and two older brothers in a small village in Berkshire. Her dad suffered from severe haemophilia, a genetic condition that causes a lack of the essential blood clotting protein which meant that even a small injury could cause a massive and potentially fatal loss of blood. Well, obviously with my dad's haemophilia, I wasn't really able to go too near him because I think I was quite a boisterous young sort of tear around everywhere. So even if I slightly knocked him or anything, he could suffer a bleed because he was um, a severe haemophiliac. And then I think my mum was very much, I think she maybe probably overcompensated for the fact I couldn't have that love from my dad. So it was very much given from my mum so my mum was very sort of nurturing always I was literally like her little shadow. Lauren's attachment to her mum grew as her dad became increasingly ill and unpredictable. He became quite volatile towards my mum so I think as well we were to protect us and my brothers he then he left and I think that would have been the first I I didn't really understand then but now looking back on it I believe that's probably the first stages of um, things weren't quite right and there was a reason because of that for like for my dad's behaviour. Though Lauren's dad moved out things continued to be difficult at home and it soon became clear to Lauren that her mum was also very unwell. Then one afternoon she called her three children into the living room. I remember us all being sat down on the sofa And my mum telling us that she was really, really ill and that she wasn't going to get better and told us what it was, that she had HIV. And immediately, I don't know why, because I didn't actually know what it was. I don't think I'd even never heard of it. But I knew just from the tone of the conversation and having been called to this family meeting that the outlook was really bad. And I just burst into tears, but not understanding any of it really at all, being a nine-year-old child. And from that point, it feels like it was only just sort of maybe a matter of days or weeks. And my mum was taken into hospital. Lauren's mum had contracted HIV from her husband, who had been treated as a child with contaminated factor eight blood product. Lauren visited her mum in hospital every few days, 
And then, one August morning in 1993, just as Lauren was leaving for another visit, the phone rang. Her mum had died. Her dad had also died at the same hospital just a few days earlier. I don't even remember if I cried. I don't know if I did. It, it happened very quickly from sort of being told that she wasn't well, going into hospital. So she'd kept it from us for as long as possible. Obviously, I do know that my dad also passed away as well, and it was within, it was very close to my mum, within eight days of one another. So that's when, at that point, really, everything just completely changed. Soon after their parents' death, Lauren and her brothers were separated, and Lauren was taken in by her aunt and uncle, who had a teenage daughter of their own. For Lauren, it meant a terrible upheaval, moving to another part of the country and changing schools. In one fell swoop, she'd lost her family, her home and her friends. It was really, really quite terrible growing up. And I was grieving for having lost my mum and dad, but I was also grieving for essentially just having to leave my brothers. Like, that was really, really difficult for me. I wouldn't see them that often because we weren't local to one another so I'd only see them maybe a few times a year during like school holidays and every time I just remember just being ripped apart from them just I hated it it was so emotional like having to come away from them having to go back to a home that was if I'm really really honest it was horrible <laughs> my cousin found it really hard having me there and I would hear arguments that she hated me, hated me and didn't want me there. And we didn't talk at all pretty much most of the years that I was there. So the atmosphere in the home was you could cut it with a knife. Like I was tiptoeing around, scared to put a foot wrong. Eventually, when she was 17, Lauren ran away and was taken in by friends. Now she was in safe territory but she still dared not mention what had happened. I was just terrified to talk about any of it because I remember being told pretty much from the get-go that what had happened to my mum and dad was it would be taken very negatively and I was better off just not talking about it or mentioning it to anyone. Because were you of the era when HIV was terrible stigma and was that I mean what do you remember of that HIV what did it mean oh it was like a death sentence and it was a dirty disease Lauren and her brothers had been tested for HIV soon after their parents had died but were found to be negative Lauren was also told as a nine-year-old that she probably shouldn't think about ever having children since she might be carrying the haemophilia gene as she grew up Lauren says she tried to shut it all out. I was always very conscious of the fact that I didn't want my parents' death to define me. Like, I was determined that I was going to get on my life and make a, try to live my life the best way that I can. And I think my only way of sort of that was that I can't dwell on my parents' death and the circumstances that they died. And I think as well as a family... Everyone just wanted to move on, and that was our way of just coping with it. And so, for the next ten years, Lauren travelled a lot and tried to lose herself in work. Then one of her brothers told her about a BBC Panorama documentary he'd seen called Contaminated Blood, The Search for Truth, which had been broadcast in 2017. For three decades, appeals to the government for a UK-wide public inquiry have fallen on deaf ears. But in recent weeks, the Haemophilia Society has intensified the debate. They say they now have evidence the society was misled about Factor VIII. Government, the pharmaceutical industry and UK doctors had information that was not shared with the Haemophilia Society in the community. And that led to tragic consequences. And then that was when it just completely opened my eyes. I was like... There's so many other people that have been affected and impacted by this and it wasn't, possibly wasn't an accident. And I had all of this information that I was like, suddenly, actually, this, this isn't right. <laughs> and how did, I mean, watching that panorama, how did you feel afterwards? Did you feel angry? No, 
I've never really felt sort of angry about everything that's happened. I think it just gave me more of a drive and awareness and that I can play a key part in trying to bring justice for a lot of people. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is Lauren Palmer. Um, for those people that don't know me, I lost both my parents um, when I was nine years old. Here's Lauren with fellow campaigners rallying outside the Cabinet Office in Whitehall back in the summer. They were calling for a speedy conclusion to the public inquiry into the contaminated blood scandal and fuller compensation for those infected and affected. I am. I am the little girl who is alone. So far, there has been no financial compensation for children, like Lauren, who lost a parent or parents or for parents like Colin and Jan, who we heard from in the last episode, who lost a child. No amount of money will ever replace my mum and dad's lives at all. But having grown up without my family and that security, that financial security, being able to have that choice of living with parents as you're growing up, trying to save up for a house, I haven't been able to do that. If there is that financial settlement, it will make my life a lot easier. But it will never compensate for, for having lost my parents in the first place and what it has done to my family. They look like... I don't really know what they look like. I began this series in Worcestershire with Andy Evans and his dogs. He was the first person I'd met who'd been infected by contaminated blood, and hearing his story back in 2018 made a huge impact on me. That was about a year after the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, had announced the public inquiry into the infected blood scandal. Now everyone is waiting to hear what the findings of the public inquiry will be when the final report is published. It's been a long wait for official recognition of what happened and for compensation for their loss and suffering. And, in the meantime, victims of this scandal are still dying or living on borrowed time, like Andy. I'm 40 years down the line from being infected with HIV. That's the front line, that's the edge of the wave. Nobody really knows what's going to happen around the corner and, the, you know, ageing with HIV could be a whole different ball game. Do you think... They fight, you know, when the report is published, do you think you'll get some closure on the whole experience? I really hope so. Obviously, we don't know what it's going to contain, but whatever it does contain, I really think this is the last bite of the cherry. Whatever happens from this inquiry is where it stops. You know, people hopefully will start to be compensated. There'll be a compensation panel set up, but as far as looking at the truth... I think the inquiry has the, the final say in that and whatever it comes out with, that's got to be our closure because there's not going to be anything else. The findings of the Infected Blood Inquiry are due to be published on May the 20th. Blood Matters was presented by Blanche Girouard. The producer was Mike Lanchin. The series was a CTVC production for BBC Radio 4. Details of support with some of the issues raised are available at bbc.co.uk slash actionline.